Thanks for joining the pilot podcast of a North South Dialogue project. I'm Lauren Huang Li from the Haley M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. This podcast is produced by the collaborative work of the International Policy Institute of the University of Washington and doing sociology in India. This is a pilot podcast of the North South Dialogue project. So we will introduce introduce everything about us today, who we are, what we are doing, and what we are going to do. There are four parts in this podcast. Part one, the North-South Dialogue Fellows will introduce themselves. Part two, I will explain what the North-South Dialogue Project is. Part three, North-South Dialogue Fellows will talk about their own research. Part four, lastly, we will discuss the general expectation of the North South Dialogue Project and upcoming podcast. Okay, let's go to the first part, introduction of a North South Dialogue Fellows. Three North South Dialogue Fellows, including me, will introduce themselves. Okay, Ritfana Dipali, hi. Please join this podcast. Hi. And hi, hi Lauren. Lauren. <laughs> Hi, like, uh, could you introduce yourself, uh, Ritupana? Please go first. Yes, sure. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our podcast. I'm Rituparna. I teach sociology in Indra Press College for Women, University of Delhi. I have a PhD in sociology from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and my PhD research was on mobile theater of Assam. My research suggests that mobile theater of Assam occupies features of a counter public, but is still a part of the larger Assamese public culture. It is often seen as an assertion of Assamese identity in the face of increasing globalization. Yet at the same time, it has adapted itself to the commercial demands of the time by using the latest technologies and content. As we progress in the podcast, I'll be happy to share more details from my research. Okay, thank you, uh, Ritupana, for your introduction. Uh, and Dipali, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, very glad to be uh, talking to all of you today. And I'm Dipali. I teach uh, at the Department of Sociology in Ranchi University. And I've recently submitted my uh, PhD uh, at Center for the Study of Social Systems at Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. And uh, my doctoral research looked at care work and questions of migration and ethnicity in India. So uh, broadly speaking, I, my research is located within uh, the academic literature on crisis in care work. And uh, I have tried to look at questions of uh, inequality, uh, both geographically, as well as in terms of uh, questions of caste and ethnicity in the country and I try to understand women's work uh, primarily in formal work within uh, contemporary Indian society. So I'll talk more about my research as we proceed with the podcast. Oh, great. Uh, okay, I will introduce myself. Um, hello, uh, I'm Lauren Huayang Li, a third year PhD student in the Jackson School of International Studies. Uh, I'm from South Korea, but currently living in Seattle. I'm interested in countries' relations, particularly Japan and South Korea. A unique thing about me is that I can speak Japanese, and then I have a diverse working experience in different countries. For example, I work in Japanese broadcasting company in New York City, uh, Korean embassy in Washington, D.C., and, th and think tanks in the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. Okay, this is the end of introduction of a North South Dialogue Fellows. And let's move on to the second part, introduction of the North South Dialogue Project. So um, I will uh, introduce uh, our project. Uh, Professor Lila Fernandez, who is the director of the Helen M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, initiate the North South Dialogue Project in in the fall of 2021. Uh, there has been knowledge inequality between the global north and south, global south, uh, because the colonial nations in the global north has been at the center of producing, exchanging, 
and disseminating knowledge for a long time. To decolonize this knowledge inequality, Professor Fernandez and the Professor Martua Yi, uh, the, can you guys pronounce you know, your advisor's name if you're fine? Like, sure, sure. It's Metri Chaudhry. Uh, Metri Chaudhry. So, sorry, yeah. Uh, Metri Chaudhry uh, of doing sociology, like set up this collaborative transnational exchange project called North South Dialogue. We wish that the North South Dialogue project can promote the equality of knowledge production, exchange, and dissemination between the global North and South. Uh, to achieve this goal, we take two approaches. First one is to release this podcast series. Second one is to upload the field note, photo, and materials from the Global North and South on our website. For the student and scholar in both the Global North and South, we provide these platforms for disseminating and exchanging their research ideas and experience equally. Now, North-South Dialogue mainly invites speakers from India and Global South, but Professor Leela hopes to expand the dialogue with other country if the project goes well. Okay, this is the end of introduction of the project. And from now on, fellows talk about their research. Uh, fellows will be the main host of the future podcast. So this will be the first and the last chance of hearing their research in this podcast series. Uh, dear fellows, uh, when you talk about your research, please also share the challenges that, that you faced when you conduct your research. Okay, uh, Richpana, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. So uh, my research is located in the state of Assam in India. And uh, like I said in the introduction, my PhD thesis, which I just recently defended in July 2021, was actually on mobile theater of Assam. Uh, and I thought that it would be interesting to look at the question of theater and its presence in Assam uh, from a sociological perspective, because academic interventions in, direction, in this direction have been generally missing. Uh, whereas you could see that it, it has immense visibility in popular culture in the state, but no academic interventions. Like I said, the field and the social location is very important because Assam has had a rich history of theatrical tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, since the 15th century, we have had a tradition of drama being developed in the state itself. And mobile theater is modernized, very, very technologically advanced, commercialized, consumerist theater. Uh, my location is also interesting because I have grown up watching a lot of theater because my father is also a dramatist. And uh, in that sense, this has been something that has uh, basically interested me since childhood. Now, when we talk of theater and particularly mobile theater in Assam, let me give a brief background of what it means. Now, these are theater troops consisting of 100 to 150 people who travel from one point of the state to another, carrying their own props, material, as well as actors. Now, Assam is actually not a very small state, and therefore it is a significant achievement when they travel from one portion of the state to another, and that too only using trucks or other road uh, you know, vehicles in that sense. This kind of theater is very popular, particularly amongst rural publics, who do not have access to maybe cinema halls or you know, other forms of entertainment like we are used to, for instance, OTT platforms. And they throng the halls and auditoriums, which are makeshift because like I said, these theater groups travel with their own equipment, set them up in the field and then they perform and the halls are completely packed. In fact, every night, there could be at least three shows that happen, you know, so three shows of the same play. Uh, it is a very particularly specific phenomena to Assam and very, very commercially popular. To do my field work, I chose a multi-sided ethnography as one of the methods because I wanted to look at the origin of mobile theater in Assam 
which is a place called Patshala, which is 110 kilometers from Guwahati, the capital city, which was my other field site. The reasoning behind the choosing multi-sited ethnography as an approach was that I realized how both these regions are equally important in the growth of mobile theater. While Pachala has been the original place in which mobile theater emerged, Guwahati is now actually the headquarter of many theater groups from where they then move on to Upper Assam, which is the uh, region of Assam that connects it to the other Northeastern states. Some of the other methods that I included were oral history, uh, participant and non-participant observation, uh, then structured and non-structured interview. And uh, I went about my data collection in a way in which I could rely on snowball sampling, because like I said, my social location as someone who is from Assam, familiar with the theatrical scene, did allow me the possibility of accessing a lot of things as well as people which otherwise would not have been possible. Um, uh, the, it was interesting in how I moved around with the two theater groups that I chose to study in a detailed manner because there are almost 60 theater groups and it was not possible for me to study each one of them in a detailed manner. Therefore, I chose two. And the highlight of my research was traveling with them and looking at their experiences and explorations firsthand. Very briefly, uh, I would like to also say that my research on mobile theater highlighted that mobile theater is, or rather it shows signs of a counter public in Assam because it is seen as a site of resistance to increasing Western as well as Hindi cultural traditions. So film, uh, sorry, theater makers see it as a form of art that presents a resistance to these Western as well as, you know, uh, Bollywood films, mostly Hindi films. However, the other interesting uh, finding was also that although it is a counter public, at the same time, it is very, very popular and commercial culture, and therefore could be located as part of the larger public culture. So in a way, there is an intersection of public. In mobile theater, uh, some of the plays that have been produced over the years include very interesting names like, uh, 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 sorry, like Jurassic Park, then Titanic, Anaconda, and as you can see, these are primarily adaptations of Hollywood films, which means that there is an incorporation of the very same Western kind of uh, culture that is being critiqued or resisted, but at the same time incorporated in a way in which it can be taken to the masses. So in a way, mobile theater is also a reflection of socio-cultural life of Assam, of how increasing commercialization is happening at every possible point, but at the same time, there is also a resistance. This is about my research. Now, uh, Dipali. Oh, uh, thanks, Rutupanna. Uh, it was just great listening to uh, you. I would now talk about my research. And like I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I look at care work in my research and I've looked at questions of uh, ethnicity and class. Uh, so my uh, doctoral research was aimed at uh, delineating a particular socioeconomic as well as political process of becoming a migrant care worker from the Chotanagpur region of Jharkhand, which is located in central India, uh, to Delhi, which is the national capital of the country. Now, uh, as this uh, theme suggests, I'm looking at uh, inequalities of class, caste or ethnic ethnicity, as well as regional inequality, because I bring in questions of uh, region, I talk about uh, identity as well as class. Now, uh, to begin with, like I had mentioned previously, my studies located within the broader literature that looks at crisis in care. Uh, I would like to state that the crisis in care is multifarious, uh, which covers issues that range from uh, the role of the welfare state to unequal burden of caring upon women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, one of them also looks at care chains, uh, and what are these care chains? Uh, those familiar with the uh, literature would know that uh, care chains uh, or 
uh, is a name given to uh, migration networks which uh, have come into being in different parts of the world uh, uh, between the global south as well uh, and the global north now my particular research looked at questions of gender migration uh, for uh, the adivasi women uh, the adivasis uh, are uh, the or the indigenous people in india they're con uh, they're constitutionally known as the scheduled tribes and they form about 8% of the entire population in the country and they are one of the most socially as well as economically marginalized groups in the country now uh, so my study tried to understand the care chains which existed between uh, chota nagpur region and jharkhand which is where uh, the adivasis uh, live traditionally uh, i look at the women who uh, have their source of migration from this region and uh, they how the ones who migrate to cities like delhi uh, now my research tried to answer two questions primarily one was why do adivasi women migrants from chota nagpur enter low paid care work which is informal work which is characterized by extreme precarity uh, and then the second question which i uh, try to answer in my research was uh, how do they enter this work right and in answering the how i look at uh, questions of migration i look at the process of training uh, that these women uh, undergo in order to become auxiliary nurses or uh, home based caregivers in uh, delhi now uh, i look at the intricacies of global capitalism in my research and how it creates structures of inequality within societies and uh, i try to understand how women belonging to a certain community a certain ethnic group interact or enter these structures of inequality and also finally how do they try to negotiate uh with the structures of inequality right uh, so the questions of migration are core are at the core of my research uh, the adivasis traditionally have been communities that uh, derive their livelihood from agriculture or they depended on forest produce with time of course and with transformations within uh, you know the economic system they move to different sources of livelihood often uh, driven by uh, against structures of inequality and sometimes also by choice so uh, as some of you might be familiar with it uh, the adivasis or the tribal communities from parts of chota nagpur central india have uh, migrated to uh, the tea plantations in uh, parts of assam and north bengal during the colonial period in india so therefore migration has had a, a very uh, significant role to play in terms of how uh, the adivasis include both men and women have uh, adapted to different uh, modes of or have uh, made different choices when it comes to livelihood now i try to historically map uh, all these migrations in my research and then uh, i try to also sort of compare why uh, what was the difference between the migrations which occurred during the colonial period and the migrations which occur in uh, for the women uh, in question right now and uh, which uh, and therein you know the questions of agency etc come into the picture and then finally what i've uh, what i'd like to talk about is uh, in order uh, you know the uh, my field work because i was trying to look at questions of migration and i was trying to look at uh, two specific places the chota nagpur region and delhi i had two uh, sites for my field work i was looking at uh, training centers in delhi as well as uh, kuti district which is in uh, which is located uh, very close to ranchi which is the capital of the state of jharkhand so uh, i was uh, simultaneously and of, of course i carried did my field work over a period of time so, uh, but and i was visiting these two sites and uh, what was interesting for my field work was uh, later on when i tried to answer the question uh, you know i look i try to understand how these women negotiate uh, their position in society as migrants uh, in urban delhi i was uh, going for meetings of a solidarity group of these women of a collective and it was interesting because all these women worked as home based workers uh, they lived within uh, 
the homes they worked in uh, as auxiliary nurses or child carers. So I, it was only on Sundays that I could meet these women. So one major challenge for me throughout my field work was that uh, I had very limited time uh, uh, to interact with my interlocutors. And secondly, uh, a significant part of my fieldwork was also uh, carried out during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, and particularly during the lockdown. So because uh, the COVID-induced lockdown had made it absolutely impossible to go and physically interact with these women, uh, I had to uh, resort to uh, telephonic interviews. I had to speak to them over the telephone. And uh, it was, again, a major challenge there was because all of these women uh, were working throughout the day. It was very difficult to talk to them. Uh, so I had to wait at the, uh, when uh, towards the end of the day, almost late night, when they'd be free from work. And that is when I was able to uh, talk to them or interview them. So this was a major challenge. Uh, and secondly, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, of studying uh, workers engaged in informal work, such as uh, care work in India, is that there is a huge paucity of data. Now, when you have a lack of data, you all, almost begin on a clean slate because you don't know where to start off. So you have to, after a lot of trials, you somehow end up finding a particular site where you find enough uh, respondents or you uh, the process of identifying the site itself is a little tough because of lack of data and then uh, finally I think one of the biggest challenges was to also uh, rely on a lot of work uh, or a lot of uh, history for the the Adivasi community is oral history. So it was very difficult to, you know, uh, find literature that talked about the history of uh, uh, the community of the people. And then uh, this was, I think these three were the major challenges that I faced as I carried out my research. Uh, so I'm going to uh, stop there and uh, over to you, Lauren. Okay, thank you. Oh, what a... Yeah, interesting project that you, you guys are doing, but that, that is really like a different with a, what I'm doing. But I, I'm just a, yeah, brief, briefly talk about yeah my research and the challenge I have. Uh, my research investigated like under which condition Japanese and Korean governments are likely to have a stable and cooperative relationship with the other country. Uh, Japan and South Korea have a very roller coaster like relationship, and then uh, many international relations scholars cannot clearly explain this unstable relationship. Uh, so I argue that uh, when domestic actors such as media, public, uh, politicians, and interest groups have a divergent perception with the state, the relations between Japan and South Korea becomes unstable. Uh, previous research did not closely examine the Japan-South Korea relationship in the context of a interaction between the state and domestic actors. So my study will fill this gap. Um, the biggest challenge that I have now is uh, that uh, due to this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, my plan for the field trip to Japan in April is canceled. Uh, since the Omicron virus is uh, widely spread, the Japanese government have, has prevented foreign people from, from coming to Japan. Uh, so I decided to delay going on the field trip, uh, but I'm still not sure uh, whether Japan will open its door to foreign people in the near future. So that is my concern. Um, Oh, and actually, uh, Rito Pana, uh, you didn't mention about yeah your challenges. So could you like uh, briefly like uh, elaborate what challenge you had in your research? Thank you, Lauren. So uh, it's interesting because for both of you, uh, submission as well as PhD has begun when we are amidst the pandemic. While I had uh, submitted in the middle of the pandemic, which means that my fieldwork was more or less done. So uh, thankfully, most of my fieldwork challenges were not COVID related, but very, very uh, logistical and methodological. 
And now since I was working with uh, actors who are quite popular and famous in, uh, you know, Assam, it was uh, difficult in, uh, you know, finding them to give me time according to, uh, even when they would set up interviews, there would be times when they would cancel because they were so busy and they always had these flexible schedules. So that was one of the challenges. And this is something that a lot of you or us again can face in the field because the respondent is the queen or the king in that case, because you have to adjust your schedule according to them. So fieldwork also in that sense teaches one patience. The other challenge that I can mention right now is how uh, when you research in a familiar setting, although you do have more access and better knowledge of the sociocultural setting, many a times what is data and what is not data can be very blurry because the familiar is very, very difficult to deconstruct and critique. So these are some challenges that not just me, but people who work on these areas as well as in the fields that are very closer to you may face. Yeah, so I think this is it with regard to the challenges. Yeah, great. I think, yeah, this is a great chance that I, our audiences know about, you know, the hostess, you know, project, what we are doing. Uh, so this is the end of, uh, you know, sharing our research. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, your thoughts and research, uh, Ritupana and Dipali. Uh, finally, in part four, we will talk about our expectations from the podcast and then share information about future podcasts. Uh, Ritupana and Dipali, uh, what kind of expectation do you have for the future podcast? Okay, so I Ritupana. want, yeah, sorry, Lauren. So I wish that we are able to build a dialogic experience with scholars from both the Global North and Global South. And we create more possibilities for collaborative work as well as co-authorship, because I feel that in today's world, all of these things are very important. Uh, I also hope that our podcast gives early career researchers, young scholars, a platform to talk about their research. And in recent years, we also see that there is more of a talk about shifting to public academia or public knowledge. And I feel that these podcasts, which simplify a lot of academic work that we do, which not everyone uh, may find accessible, uh, for them, it will be easier to you know, know about our work as well as listen to us. So some of the upcoming podcasts that we have in our series, uh, ones that I would be hosting would be talking about sports development and urbanization, as well as relationship between environment and, you know, water and land resources. So I'm looking forward to listening to other scholars and learning from them. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dipali. Yeah, I think uh, I very much... Uh... Uh, you know, agree with what Ritupanna is saying. I have similar expectations out of this project. But I would just like to, uh, you know, add that uh, through this project, I think what I'm very eager to know is, you know, uh, the themes that scholars located within different parts of the globe are researching on. So, I mean, it would be interesting to see what themes of uh, research interest people in different parts of the world and maybe if we are able to say identify a pattern or common themes and then sort of go on to create a global uh, you know knowledge maps uh, so that might be something which I'm looking forward to and uh, of course uh, we have some very interesting podcasts coming up and from very uh, early career researchers located again in different parts of the world and uh, working on very interesting themes. So yes, uh, a lot to look uh, forward to. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, we will upload it like sixth episode uh, of a podcast. And then all of the podcast speakers uh, are actually from Global South this time. Uh, actually our like original plan was to invite the speakers from both the Global North and South and make them have uh, conversations, but we couldn't do this time. So in the future, I hope that the North South Dialogue Project provide a place for uh, having conversation between the scholars for the global North and South uh, who have a similar academic background. 
Uh, but actually, it, it is meaningful that the podcast gave a chance for scholars in the global south uh, first to share their research and experience because in terms of equality of knowledge dissemination, you know, they deserve to speak out first and then scholars of global north can have a valuable chance to hear their voices first and then like I I think I, yeah you guys mentioned briefly about our yeah future podcast but you know like each fellow in charge of the two podcast series in the spring quarter uh, and we find out that some participants have a similar research interest so uh, we group them and we'll have a discussion based on the topic uh, in case of Dipali, uh, her participants don't show a similar topic of interest, so she will have a separate podcast with the two members. Uh, the uploading date will be decided uh, depending on the time of uh, finishing recording the podcast, but we will uh, up give you an update. Okay, uh, so this is the end of our pilot podcast, and uh, th is there any last words, you know? to the listeners, like uh, Ritupana Dipali, any last words? Well, uh, Lauren, let me take this opportunity to uh, ask, you know, more scholars from the Global North as well as Global South to send their submissions as we hope to continue the series and uh, keep listening to us. And thank you everyone for the support. Dipali, do you have anything to add? No, not at all. Just uh, very excited that we're finally, uh, you know, starting with the podcast and uh, very uh, excited and looking forward to a lot of great submissions in the future. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for yeah your participation. And then, yeah, I look forward to, you know, yeah, listening your podcast too, you know, in the future. Yeah. Thanks for uh, listening to the pilot podcast of a North-South Dialogue. Uh, and if you want to contact us, uh, please send us an email uh, to nsdialogue at uw.edu. Again, nsdialogue at uw.edu. Thanks, everyone, and then see you in the next podcast. Bye.